All right, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming this evening and taking time out of your busy schedule. We appreciate it. My name is Dana Freehoff, and I am a proud member of the League of Women Voters. And I will be your moderator for this evening um, for this evening's candidate forum for San Diego County Board of Supervisors, District 4. So this is a special election to fill um, the vacant seat for the remainder of the current term that's ending in January 2027. And if no candidate receives a majority of the vote at the primary election on August 15th, that is the voting day, um, then a special general election will be held on November 7th. So this forum um, is an opportunity for the community to ask the questions that you care most about and a chance for the candidates to explain their positions. It's a forum with the voters and not a debate between the candidates. So I'd like to thank our candidates for coming this evening. Um, Jess, uh, um, I'll get the names. Um, Janessa Goldbeck, Monica montgomery Step, and Paul McQuig. So thank you very much for coming and being willing to participate in the forum. Um, I'll say our fourth candidate, Amy um, Reichert, uh, was invited to the forum, but unfortunately she could not make it. And then most importantly, I'd like to thank you for, for coming to the forum this evening and uh, wanting to become an informed voter. That is our motto at the League of Women Voters. And so some housekeeping rules. The bathrooms are located right in that direction, out that way, out that door down the hallway. And then if you could silence your cell phones, that would be great. Thank you. So the League of Women Voters is proud to be a nonpartisan, to be nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties, but always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. So as part of our mission to educate voters, the League of Women Voters moderates candidate forums using a format that we feel is fair and informative. And the candidates have all agreed um, to this format in advance. And so now I'd like just to review um, the format real quickly for this evening's um, event. So the candidates are each gonna have two minutes for their opening statement. Um, and then they'll have, we'll have a series of questions um, and they'll have one minute to respond to those questions and then they'll have another two minutes for their closing remarks. And then we have a timekeeper, Jeannie, here, who will um, keep track of the time by raising paddles um, as a, at agreed upon intervals. There's her paddles. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and the, for those interested in asking questions, and we encourage you, please, to ask questions, um, we have volunteers, um, Kim and Anna, who um, are gonna be passing out index cards and pens and they will, um, if you could raise your hands, I think everybody can see them. And it, then if you have a question, um, you can raise your hand and she can pick up those cards once you filled them out. And just to let you know, there's no questions um, from the floor. So if you have a question, and again, we encourage you to ask questions, um, you know, please fill out one of the cards. And now in regards to the question, please word them kind of in a general way so all candidates can respond to them. Um, so questions directed specifically to one candidate will be held until there are specific questions for all the candidates. And please, please remember to use civility and respect in wording your questions, keep your questions succinct, and any lengthy commentary prefacing a question um, will not be read. And, and the volunteers can assist you too if you need help in, in writing the questions. And again, as I mentioned, there'll be no verbal questions from the floor, so please um, you know, fill out one of those cards if you have some questions. Then what's gonna happen is the, question, uh, the um, questions will be given to our screeners, and we have Diana and Donna and Vanetta, and they'll just kind of screen the questions to make sure that we're not asking the same question uh, one, more than once or twice or that type of thing, just to make sure we can keep it flowing. And then one final item, um, since the candidate forum is designed to provide a nonpartisan setting for undecided voters to hear all positions, any demonstrations of support or opposition to the candidates or their positions will be out of order. And unheeded warnings may result in cancellation of the forum. So if you wanna applaud or um, we would encourage you to wait until the end of the forum um, to do that, for example. And so I think, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so now we're gonna start with the opening statements. And the candidates, um, I uh, picked out numbers, and so we'll go based on that. And first is, they'll have two minutes. And candidate Goldbeck, you're up first. 
That's fine. Um, can folks hear me okay? Yes. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Janessa Goldbeck. I was born and raised here in San Diego County. Um, I really appreciate you taking time to be out here this evening on a very warm day in the middle of the, the work week. It means a lot. Uh, my, my mom was a public school teacher. My dad drove a tow truck going, growing up, and I was very fortunate to go to Chicago for my undergraduate education, where I studied journalism and African studies. And those, my education took me to Uganda and Rwanda, where I learned about an ongoing genocide in the Darfur region of Sudan. I wanted to do something about it. I wanted our government to step up and do more to protect people who lived there. And so I started organizing on my campus and moved to Washington, D.C. right out of school to become a professional human rights organizer. Uh, that's where I spent the first chapter of my career, learning how to pass federal legislation. I fell in love with it, but I also knew that just doing the humanitarian work wasn't enough. We also needed security in some of these places. Um, and so at the age of 26 years old, I decided to join the United States Marine Corps. I served for seven years as a combat engineer officer, as well as a uniform victim advocate, working to protect victims of sexual assault and help them navigate the system. Um, I got out in 2019 of the Marine Corps, came home to San Diego because my mom got really sick. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and I'm an only child, so I knew I needed to come home and take care of her. Since then, I've been running a national veterans advocacy organization that represents over a million and a half veterans and uh, their families across the country. Our job is to lift up their voices in policy conversations that impact them at the federal, state, and local level. And I want to put that expertise to work. I've been doing that work for 15 years. When I think about San Diego County and the problems our region faces, uh, whether it's homelessness or the cost of living or entrenched poverty, the county is really where the rubber meets the road on solving those things. And I'm very uh, excited and honored to be with you tonight to discuss some of the pressing issues that are facing our region. So thank you so much for being here. I look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you. Um, candidate Montgomery Step. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the 4th District. I represent this district on the City Council, and I'm very proud of the work that we have been able to do. This is the district I was born and raised in, and I'm also uh, born and raised in the Supervisorial District that I am now running for. And I just want to say to Mr. Payne, thank you for hosting the meetings for the Black Arts and Culture District. Uh, we were able to partner with community advocates and pass that resolution to designate these eight blocks as the Black Arts and Culture District in the city of San Diego, which is extremely important for the revitalization of this area. So as I said, born and raised in San Diego, um, I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, came back and went to California Western School of Law here and also practice law in the areas of uh, some civil rights, um, uh, employee rights cases in addition to bankruptcy. I entered the, the law profession when many, many people were losing their homes at the downturn of the economy back in 2007, 2008. So we were able to fight banks and file um, injunctions against banks so that people could keep their homes, which is oftentimes the number one way that they pass on generational wealth to their families. Um, after that, I worked for three elected officials at the city of San Diego, went to the ACLU and led uh, a campaign to reform the bail system that we have in the state of California. It was a state initiative. I led the local campaign at the NCLU. And then I went on to city council where now I am chair of the budget and government efficiency committee. I have facilitated the process over the $5.2 billion budget that we have at the city of San Diego. I've invested in first time home buyer uh, programs for especially for people of color and also have reimagined public safety and really been effective in the leadership around changing the conversation of what it means to be safe in our communities. Look forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you. And can I take this please? Um, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I am Paul McQuig. Uh I am also a retired, a retired Marine. Uh, I was wounded in combat in Iraq in 2006 when I retired from the Marine Corps. Um, about 15 years later, um, I uh, set my roots here in Webster. So Webster is the neighboring community. Um, and more importantly than being a retired Marine is I'm a father. I'm a single father. And my son went to high school here in San Diego. Um, so I planted roots here in Webster. Um, when he comes home from college, that's going to be his house, not mine. 
uh, Coach Dunn at Lincoln High School uh, wanted to recruit my son to play football for him, um, his senior year in high school. Um, and then we all know what happened that last year of 2020, 2021 with COVID. Um, so we made the decision that my son was going to stay at the high school he was at and not come over to Lincoln. Although, if any of you have kids or grandkids that play at Lincoln, some of them have been to my house because um, my son has a lot of friends in the neighborhood. Um, I was also a police and fire commissioner in the city of Oceanside, where we were proud to have a response rate of uh, seven minutes to an emergency for the police. Um, now, you may think Oceanside is not that big, but it is the third largest city in the country, behind Tula Vista and uh, San Diego itself. Um, the response rate right now in San Diego is 44 to 36 minutes for a non-firearm related emergency. That's unacceptable. Um, the current city council has hamstrung our police by passing vaccine mandates, and we've lost a lot of police officers because of that. Uh, I would like to fight against that and bring our police officers back. Law enforcement has a huge role to play here at Second Chance with the probation officers, and we need to stand with law enforcement uh, as we move forward into the future. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, we'll now go to questions. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Great, thank you. Um, the first question is, um, as you probably all know, the, the County Board of Supervisors has a represent, represent, uh, representative on the Sandeg Board. Um, if you were on Sandeg, how would you solve um, the issue of the train route to Los Angeles? Um, you know, we've had problems with, uh, especially now in, with Orange County and the issues along the Do Del Mar um, Bluff area. Um, so, uh, again, how would you solve the train route to Los Angeles? Under, underground was the question. And um, we're going to start with um, candidate Goldbeck, please. Sure. Um, so the question is a around uh, the, the train route between San Diego and Los Angeles. There's been an ongoing issue with bluff collapse there, and that's shut down our train service uh, on, on multiple occasions. Uh, to back and forth, which is a big deal for commuters and for uh, for many other things. Um, you know, the that is a, that problem is much bigger than the San Diego County Board of Supervisors and SANDAG. Um, this is an issue that requires federal uh, intervention and federal attention. Uh, Congressman Mike Levin, who represents that area, has been. Uh, very uh, vocal and engaged on making sure that we get the federal dollars and attention that we need. I'm, I'm proud to, to be endorsed by him. And I think when we think about transit in our region uh, more globally, um, outside of North County and, and here uh, all the way down to South County, we need to think about making investments that make transit more accessible and faster for people. Um, I know it, it right now our trolley, uh, there are some routes, the blue line, that are heavily used, but many others are much too slow and feel unsafe for people to use. So we need to invest and making those faster. All right, candidate um, Montgomery Step. Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, in my current capacity, I have served on the Senate Transportation Committee um, and also been an alternate to the Senate Board of, of Directors. And when this issue came up, we would have to go back and forth to the state in order to restore the, the bluff area uh, that the train runs through. So the, the issue is, uh, do we keep it as we get the, as it is now and try to get more money from the state and the federal government? Do we move it inland so that we're not having to deal with the bluffs, or do we go underground? And I think the middle ground sort of is to move the train inland. I love taking the train up to LA, it's a beautiful view, uh, but uh, right now it is not sustainable unless we uh, completely revitalize uh, the bluffs, which means it's, it's extremely expensive and it's also not necessarily sustainable. So that is the uh, what is before the, the SANDAC board right now. Of course, we have an active executive director that goes back and forth to the state and the federal government to uh, solicit that funding. Um, but that is what is at issue. And I think that moving it inland is, is probably the most feasible solution at this point. All right. Um, candidate McQuaid. <coughs> So I've, I've ridden the train to LA and then had to stop and get off the train and then ride a bus for over an hour to uh, north and then get back on the train and then ride to LA or Anaheim or wherever I, wherever I go. Um, 
And we need to look outside California for ideas. I think too many of the ideas are staying uh, contained here in California. There are engineers, there are people all over the world who have designed better systems than what we have right now. Um, all we've been doing is putting a Band-Aid on it, and then we let it go for a little while, and the Band-Aid comes off. Um, in Europe, they have the tunnel, which goes from France to the uh, United Kingdom. Um, we all know that Sacramento is in love with the bullet train from Japan. Um, so if we're going to use ideas from other places other than uh, California, then let's utilize them properly so we're not wasting money and we're not um, just putting a Band-Aid on something that is going to fall off a couple months later. All right. Uh, next question. What is the biggest issue or challenge in District 4 as you see it? Um, how will you make a positive change in this area? And we will start with uh, some, excuse me, um, candidate Montgomery Step. So I, I, these questions are tough because I see government as different silos working together, but the main issue that I think and the biggest issue and the most urgent issue is homelessness. Uh, we see that with homelessness and housing. Uh, we can talk about both of those sort of in the same conversation, but oftentimes, you know, they are also presented as separate issues. Um, for me, what we need at the county is a, is a supervisor that understands local government and the coordination that needs to occur with a lot of the services that we have now. We have, do, do not have all of our nonprofit organizations at the table who are dealing with this issue uh, in, on a, in a grassroots way. So they need to be engaged in the conversation along with the larger providers. We need compassion, um, but we also need coordination. And the things that we are spending our money on now especially our homeless management integration system, that data system is not being appropriately used. We need to ensure that the money we're spending uh, is being appropriately used. <clears throat> so uh, one minute is definitely not enough to uh, answer this question and elaborate, as you can see. Um, so we have multifaceted issues that are the main issues in District 4. Homelessness is one of them, but we also have the rising cost of living, um, the lack of affordable housing, and uh, the rising crime. Uh, so all of those things combined to make what is more or less an imperfect storm that has affected not just District 4, but the county as a whole. And as uh, Council Member Stepp said, uh, we need to bring everything together um, especially when it comes to the homeless and treat the issues firsthand, bring the nonprofits together, because you have nonprofits all over the county that are doing great stuff, but if the homeless can't get to them, then they're not doing as enough. So um, you can look at the articles that were recently written in the paper that I responded to, and also check my website for some of those solutions, because I don't have enough time to completely address all of them. Thank you. I agree that um, homelessness is um, one of the biggest issues facing our region, and I've been part of the effort uh, running a, a national veterans advocacy organization to uh, significantly make impact on reducing veterans' homelessness, and we've seen a, 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 that result here in the county as well. I think when we think about our ho our homeless populations, we know that they are not a monolith, and the way that we make forward progress is by really zeroing in on populations that are ex extraordinarily vulnerable and want to get off the streets. So two groups that I think the county could really and should prioritize are seniors and families with kids. We know that 29% of our homeless population are people over the age of 55, many of whom are experiencing homelessness for the first time because of rising rents. I'd like to see a stipend program expanded and made permanent for people who are in danger of losing their housing so that they can remain housed. And for families with small kids, we need to work hand in hand with the school district. Oftentimes, this is a population that remains invisible. It's people bouncing from their friends or their relatives' houses. Um, we need to ensure that, that kids are in permanent housing and, make, and work directly with the families and our schools to make that happen. All right. Thank you, candidates. Uh, the next question. Have you heard of housing trusts that make it possible for low-income persons to purchase homes? Is that possible here? And we will start with candidate McQuig, please. <clears throat> um, so to answer the question about housing trust, yes. 
Um, Habitat for Humanity is one such organization that does housing trusts, um, but the problem is you have to have land. Um, so they need land granted to them, and what you do is the, the prospective homeowners put in sweat equity hours towards building that house. They also have to go through financial education courses, they go through parenting courses if they have children, and they also are required to um, uh, put in some of these volunteer hours. And then that house is becomes theirs once it's built. I think that that is a, more, a very viable way to bring affordable housing here. Um, Hershey, Pennsylvania, uh, all those houses in Hershey, Pennsylvania were built by the Hershey Company for their factory workers. Um, and that's how that town got on the map. So yes, it's 100% possible to do those types of um, housing developments here in San Diego. It just takes the cooperation and the land, and there's plenty of money in the budget, $8.1 billion at the county level, to provide that land. Go back. Yeah, I read a great article on housing trusts earlier this morning. I can't remember where, but um, it's a great question. And uh, to Paul's point, uh, what's necessary uh, is, of course, the land and the houses. Um, I think one way the county can be particularly impactful is by mirroring something that uh, San Diego Unified School District is doing right now, which is to build workforce housing on their own land. We know that land is very expensive, uh, so the county has quite a bit of excess land. And we also have tens of thousands of employees at the county. What I'd like to see is the county build housing, uh, low-income, affordable, and middle-income housing for our janitorial workers, for our, uh, our psychiatric nurses, for our social workers, for our doctors uh, who work for the county so they can live near where they work. Um, if we remove the cost of land from the housing equation, housing gets a lot cheaper to build. And I think that would be one way the county could really make an impact um, I, I love the idea of housing trusts, but uh, you know the, the county's ability to really make a big stride forward, building units at scale, I think comes from looking at its own land, working with nonprofit partners um, and others to, to develop those housing solutions. All right, next question. Oh, oh, we forgot. oh I'm sorry. Oh, okay. candidate Montgomery Step, I'm okay. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, please. Go it's ahead. A, it's okay. Don't yes. keep me honest. <laughs> so I'd like to We're very it. fair around here. Yeah. Yeah. Fair and impartial yeah. elections, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 But yes, housing trusts absolutely is a good way, um, and also for government to engage in providing uh, housing at a lower land at a lower cost, so that the housing prices go down. Uh, also, the county has um, an innovative uh, innovative trust fund um, that money can be input it into that can help developers bridge their gaps when they are trying to build affordable housing and go through all that is required to do that in the state of California. But I've also been dedicated to first time home buyers in San Diego because we know that it is so uh, hard to own a home in San Diego. And so under my leadership at the city county reinvestment task force, uh, we applied for funding from Wells Fargo. They have a program called the Worth Program. Uh, we were chosen of one out of eight cities in the entire nation to receive funding for first time home buyers in the amount of $7.5 million. We want to build on that. There are many different ways to house folks. Um, housing Trust is one of them. All right, here's a simple question we received. Um, and we will start with candidate Montgomery Stepp. Um, who, are, who are you endorsed by? Oh, okay. I'm endorsed by the San Diego County Democratic Party. Uh, I'm endorsed by the San Diego and Imperial County Labor Council. I'm endorsed by Secretary of State uh, Dr. Shirley Weber, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs, Assemblymember Keila Weber, Assemblymember David Alvarez, uh, Council President Sean Elo Rivera, uh, council members Vivian Moreno, Joe LaCava, and Kent Lee. Uh, council members in La Mesa, Patricia Dillard and Jack Shu. Uh, three of, of the San Diego Community Council uh, College trustees. Um, a lot of endorsements by uh, Democratic clubs, the Working Families Party as well. I'm very uh, honored to have received those endorsements. We, we, it's a very competitive race and we earn those endorsements and I'm grateful that they also reflect the values that I hold as a candidate to stand up for our most vulnerable communities and our working families. All right, candidate McQuick. 
uh, this is my first election. Um, as most of you know, I'm a nuclear on the block. Uh, I am not endorsed by anyone except for my friends and family. So if you know some of them and we want to talk to them, uh, they'll tell you all about me. Um, and it's not endorsements that win elections, though it's the person that they're voting for that, will win the, that can win the election based off of what they can do for the people that they're supposed to serve. Uh, I'm proud to say that I'm endorsed by our San Diego County firefighters, by the San Diego County Medical Society, by Democrats uh, like Congressman Scott Peters, Congressman Mike Levin, Congressman Juan Vargas, uh, former Congresswoman Susan Davis. I'm also endorsed by the majority of our Senate delegation, including Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins, uh, Senator Steve Padilla, uh, dozens of other local elected officials. Uh, including members of our San Diego City Council, members of North County cities, uh, South, as well as uh, parts of the unincorporated area as well. So, um, you know, as, as Paul said, endorsements matter. Um, you know, it tells you the work folks have done. I'm proud that my career has allowed me to work at um, all levels of government, federal, state, and local. The problems that San Diego County faces, uh, local government can make a big impact on, but we're not going to solve them by themselves. It's going to require coordination with our federal and state partners. So I'm very proud to be endorsed by the majority of the folks representing us in those levels of government so that we can get every dollar that San Diego County deserves and bring it home and put it to work for our community. All right. Thank you, candidates. Um, the next question, and if you need me to repeat it, let me know. The intersectionality of mental health, the justice system, substance abuse, and the unsheltered is real. So are the millions being spent on interventions um, with the problems growing exponentially. So what is your plan? And we will start with um, Kennedy Goldberg. So the, the absurd and tragic reality is that we use our county jails right now as our region's number one provider of mental health care services. And we will never solve the problem that way. Um, so it is imperative that we build the appropriate psychiatric facilities. The county right now is short, over 700 psychiatric beds. We anticipate we will need 18,000 additional behavioral health workers in the next decade to meet the scale of the crisis. Um, and we, we have to invest in these things if we're going to break the cycle. So uh, I currently sit on the county's behavioral health advisory board. Uh, this issue is very important to me. I believe we have to make this a priority when it comes to funding and resources uh, so that we are not taking people and putting them, taking them from the streets and putting them in jail and cycling them back out, but actually getting them the best services they need and then placing them in long-term permanent supportive housing so that they can remain housed, remain taking, getting the help that they need um, and, and stay off the streets. And I admit it, it's just, that's, that's just step one. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get to it later. All right, candidate Montgomery staff. Yeah, a minute is not long enough, but you know, the, the intersectionality of all the things that were named in the question is the reason why I do what I do. And I have been dedicated to building out a public safety ecosystem because public safety is not just law enforcement. It certainly includes law enforcement, but it's not just law enforcement. It is social workers. It is violence interrupters. You know, it's, it's counselors. It's, you know, it, all types of people that help us thrive and live. And so the way that we look at and fund public safety now needs to be reevaluated in this day and time. That's why I've championed a No Shots Fired program uh, to work with law enforcement to bring in violence interrupters who have been a part of that life, have been homeless, have been um, former gang members because they are the ones best positioned to help those that are in the sit current situation. And it's more effective oftentimes than the millions of dollars that we are spending on being reactive to these problems instead of proactive. All right. Senator McQuig. I'm a senator. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I am so I'll, sorry. I'll take it. <laughs> I, 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 need, I, need <laughs> I, I, well, I don't know if I really want that. <laughs> <laughs> Candidate McQuig. <laughs> yeah, I, I must. Yeah. <laughs> um, to piggyback on a lot of what Janessa said, um, we need a 500-bed hospital here in the county um, that focuses on mental health and drug addiction recovery. <coughs> 
Um, Veterans Village of San Diego was founded by Vietnam veterans who came home and they found that veterans were not being treated well and they were living on the streets and they were addicted to drugs and they were homeless and they had mental health issues. Veterans Village of San Diego every summer puts on what's called a Veterans Jam down at San Diego High School. I volunteered there before. What they do is they bring all the nonprofits in and they bring all of the veteran homeless in that are invited to and they connect them with services, get them mental health counseling, get them drug treatment, uh, get them to the dentist, so on and so forth. The county has the land as well as the resources to do a homeless stand down on our land where they transport the homeless to where they need to be, bring all of the nonprofits together, and if it takes a month, it takes a month. If it takes two months, it takes two months. But we cycle people through, we connect them with the services that they need, and then they go into a tiered system where they work towards um, being contributing members of society once again. All right, next question. Currently, for someone to speak at a Board of Supervisors meeting, they must sign up on the website. This prevents blind people and those without internet access from speaking at the meeting. The current county clerk has refused to switch to a system like Zoom that allows everyone to participate, even from a landline. How will you go about making these meetings more accessible? And we will start with um, candidate McQuaid. <clears throat> so I went to um, the La Mesa uh, City Council meeting last night. Um, uh, in the rest, it wasn't there. Um, but uh, that's her hometown. I was hoping to sit here there. But um, I feel that, and when I was a police and fire commissioner in the Ocean Side, um, we utilized all methods possible to make those uh, meetings available to everyone. Um, a private citizen is a private citizen, and especially those that are disabled. Um, we need to be able to accommodate the disabled so that they can have access to their government just as much as anyone else. Um, just because someone is disabled doesn't mean that they're less of a voice. Um, and um, speaking from experience, uh, I can, I've been treated that way in the past, so um, um, to blatantly turn someone's request down because someone doesn't want to put the work in is the wrong answer. We should bend over backwards to make sure that all of the people in our county are avail available and able to access these public forums because they're supposed to be open to the uh, entire, um, every citizen. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this is certainly an accessibility issue and um, should be checked to make sure that what the county d is doing is actually legal because there are laws against, you know, not having access for every single person. So I think some of the ways to solve this, we've received another question around this, around a ASL services. And I think one of the issues is we don't bring people from the disabled advocacy community in at the very beginning when we are making these decisions, contracting out with these different companies and providing these services. I think it's very, very important that we don't put ourselves in, uh, in a position to go back and try to fix something when we have folks at the table in the very beginning that need to be there that will let us know what we need to do, then we don't spend our time, you know, uh, you know, going back to, to correct that. So I think accessibility is very, very important, especially for Board of Supervisors meetings, because we need to hear from the entire community. That's what government is supposed to be all about. And so absolutely uh, looking into that uh, once I get there <laughs> uh, will be, be a priority for me. I uh, agree with, with everything that's been said so far, obviously accessibility, uh, making the, the Board of Supervisors and the meetings open to everyone um, is, is how it should be and I, I would think that the county is out of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act if th those things don't exist, so absolutely need to look into that. Um, I also think that the time and date of uh, when, when meetings happen during the work day uh, often means that most people can't participate um, because people are at work or taking care of their kids or at school. And so I think it's important for supervisors to not just hear from the public at those meetings, but to actually get out into the public, to go to the communities. This district is incredibly diverse, uh, stretches from South County all the way up into Kearney Mesa, out into the unincorporated parts of, uh, of East County. And we've got all kinds of different communities who need all kinds of different things. And so I think it's important 
as your next supervisor, I pledge to be physically present in the community um, and to have staff that represent the diversity of uh, voices and communities in District 4. All right, next question. Um, a number of people have died in county jails over the last several years. Um, what changes are needed? And we will start with candidate Montgomery Stepp. So I've been very vocal about this on the campaign trail. It kind of um, goes along with what I talk about with my, my life's work really advocacy around our criminal legal system. So there are quite a few things that, that can be done. There, there are a couple of bills moving state right now because the County Board of Supervisors has limited authority over the sheriff. Um, there's, uh, you know, the sheriff is elected. Uh, the charter is very clear about that limited authority. It's really mostly over the, the budgetary process and not much else, but there are still ways to be engaged um, to use our voices and our influence um, to call out these issues, but also to provide uh, more staff and uh, uh, even wage increases for nurses and doctors that have to work inside the jails. Um, accountability, though, is key. Uh, this issue needs to continue to be uplifted in the public sphere, and I will continue to do that because we have to do better. San Diego is one of the high jails with the highest rates of deaths right now in California. All right. Candidate um, Goldbeck? A sentence to jail should never mean a sentence to death. Unfortunately, in San Diego County, that, that is what it means. Uh, it, it has been one of the, uh, as the council member said, one of the highest rates in the state. And there was a, a scathing audit done by the state with, which made recommendations. And I believe it's the board's duty to hold uh, the sheriff accountable, to have regular check-ins. Uh, but there's also a major problem with a lack of appropriate medical staff in the county jails because a starting salary in those jails uh, is equal to the starting salary of somebody working at Target. And if you've spent any time in the county jail system, you know that uh, that's a pretty unpleasant place to be. So we need to ensure that we are recruiting and retaining the appropriate mental um, medical staff to make evaluations. We also need to make sure that drugs aren't getting into our jails. One of the leading causes of death is overdose. There's a hundred million dollars coming to the county from a settlement uh, from o opioid, uh, an opioid settlement. We need to make sure that some of that money is used to ensure that drugs do not continue to get into our jails so that people don't have the opportunity to overdose and die. I uh, also agree with to incentivize mental health and medical professionals in the jails. Um, we often need to stop the, um, we need to also reduce the jail population. Um, and that focuses on, on at risk youth, some of the things that Second Chance does here. Um, the Police Athletic League, uh, ABC Youth Foundation, which gives uh, at risk children, um, they use a vehicle of boxing to give at risk children alternatives to crime, gangs, drugs, so on and so forth. If you can limit the jail population, um, then we can have more those mental health providers and guards who are supposed to be second on people won't have as many people to check on. Um, we need to show our, our youth that there are alternatives to what they're doing, what they're offered. Um, I know that the county can uh, definitely help fund that. We have a shortage of probation officers, and for those of you that don't know, probation officers not only take care of our previously incarcerated, they also work with the youth in the, in the county at the juvenile hall, as well as here with Second Chance. So if you have fewer probation officers, you have fewer one-on-one -on -one time with those um, at-risk youth as well. All right, next question. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. What can the county do to make sure the state goals are met for reducing greenhouse gas emissions? So this is a climate change. Um, related question, and we'll start with candidate Goldbeck. Uh, well, the number one cause of emissions in in San Diego County and in the in the country are is from few vehicles, vehicles on the road, and so we need to ensure that we're getting folks uh, to live closer to where they work so they can spend less time commuting. 
And uh, one thing that I would like to do is uh, really make sure that we're using every part of the county as a place to build housing where it makes sense. We don't want to be building in high wildfire areas, um, but we have uh, the opportunity to build so that people don't have to be driving to Riverside or living across the border in Tijuana and spending hours idling at the border. Uh, the second thing is that we have historic amounts of funding coming from the federal government thanks to the passage of bills like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Hundreds of billions of dollars in climate resilient infrastructure that we could put to work. San Diego County currently gets its butt kicked when it comes to per capita federal funding. Imperial County gets more money per capita than we do. We need to make sure we've got folks at the county who are aggressively going after those dollars so that we can be a leader in transitioning to a clean energy economy here in San Diego. All right, candidate McQuick. Um, so we have to do a number of things um, to uh, mitigate climate change. Um, retrofitting buildings, older buildings with more modern technology. Um, I feel that we need more solar farms here in uh, Southern California and the county. Uh, right now, the push for electric vehicles has taken us a little bit too far. Uh, last summer, everyone was, in, was encouraged to buy electric vehicles, and then also last summer, we were told that we didn't have enough electricity in the county to charge the vehicles. Um, at this point, we only have the infrastructure for, I think, hybrids at this point, and the cost of electric vehicles is also too high. There should be incentives, tax breaks for those that buy electric vehicles so that they're not spending all their money on that and then pressing themselves out of the home. Um, there are multiple things that the county could be doing um, to uh, mitigate climate change, and it's definitely going to take a lot longer than a minute to cover all those. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the county recently passed uh, new transportation standards and a new way to calculate uh, vehicle miles tra traveled VMT. It's really a hot topic of uh, our discussions. And I'm the only candidate on record for supporting uh, those new standards because of the emission of uh, GHDG and the standards that we have to meet, the mandates that we have to meet that the state has put upon us. Uh, with regard to our climate action. I've been endorsed by uh, many climate groups, climate defenders, the Climate Cabinet, the Environmental uh, Health Coalition PAC, uh, because of my advocacy around environmental justice. And I have made the connection between um, why climate justice is important, especially in communities that have been underserved, that the connection uh, may not always be there, you know, because of the economic needs of our communities. And so I'm willing to continue to do that work. I've also served on the San Diego Community Power um, Board uh, to promote renewable energy for our communities. All right, thank you. Um, the LG LGBTQ community is under increasing attack across the nation. How, as a county supervisor, do you plan to show leadership and support of our local LGBTQ community. And we will start with um, candidate McQuaid. Um, so uh, I, I think I've told this story before, but um, uh, I've, so I, my brother-in-law is gay. Um, he and I are very close. He lives in Los Angeles. Um, we don't really go to see each other um, around the holidays, um, but we have a great time. Um, um, I feel that when, and I don't know exactly how much influence the county supervisors have on a lot of this legislation. Um, however, I feel when it comes to dealing with people, you judge an individual as an individual. Um, you don't judge an entire group of individuals as, as such. Um, uh, my mom is here, she's black and Native American, my dad is white. Uh, so I'm mixed, so I know what it's like to be judged as a black person. Um, and not everyone's the same, right? Um, not everyone behaves the same. You can't judge a whole group of people just like one person. So you don't, and we also don't punish the 90% for what the 10% may be doing that's wrong. So we take every instance, case by case, and then that's when we legitimate or we don't. Thank you. All right, um, candidate Montgomery Stapp. Yes, this is an important issue across the nation, and we're seeing um, parts of this type of bigotry creep, you know, creep into the San Diego County. Uh, we've seen it recently. So I've always 
uh, been an ally, I've, I've stood up for LGBTQ uh, rights and also black trans rights in particular um, within the city council and outside of the city council. I don't think hate belongs anywhere. I've always been an advocate for our most vulnerable communities. I will, will continue to do that. And I think as a county board of supervisors, uh, just as some of the roles that we've had to take um, in, at the city council against hate, uh, passing resolutions that call out um, hate in our communities, but also um, serving with regard to racial profiling and identity profiling. I've been a big voice in standing up for uh, most vulnerable communities that are improperly stopped by officers. Um, LGBTQ uh, communities experience that quite often along with black communities. There's a lot of intersection there. So I will continue to stand up for the rights of our most vulnerable communities. All right, and then um, candidate Go back to this. So we've seen a historic number of anti-LGBTQ legislation across state legislatures. Local government is really where the front lines of these attacks. Uh, a, lo a lot of uh, far-right groups that are seeking to stoke hate and division in our communities. Uh, you know, I'm proud to say that I've, I've served as the co-chair of the board for the San Diego LGBT Community Center, the largest service provider for the LGBTQ community in our region. I'm also a board member at Equality California, which is the largest statewide civil rights organization working to uh, protect the rights of L the LGBTQ community. And I think it's really important that in this time, we have a supervisor at the county uh, who is going to be not just an ally, but a champion, uh, who's going to stand up and fight back, who will call out uh, hate and bigotry where they see it, but also take action. There's currently a member of the, the City Human Rights Commission who has spoken up against the trans community, in particular the black trans community, still sitting in that position today. Um, that's something that I would change. And so as the first openly gay woman on the board, um, this would be something that would be a, a priority for me, absolutely. All right, next question. Um, with childcare being so expensive for some, how would you help to provide child care services for not only low-income families, but all families across the board? And we will start with Kennedy Goldbeck. Sure. First of all, how's everybody doing out there? It's really warm in here, so like, feel free to uh, shake it up a little bit. Um, I know I'm sweating up here. Um, the, the, the issue is, I didn't mean to detract it now, I just took 15 seconds for myself, but the issue is child care. We could talk about this for an hour and a half because the cost of child care here is keeping uh, people out of the workforce. It's cheaper at, uh, in many cases for people to stay home and take care of their kids than it is to go to work. That is a huge problem. So a couple of different things we need to do. One, we have a shortage of facilities. So how can the county fast track uh, licensing, making sure we're taking all the proper precautions, but fast track licenses, uh, maybe for folks who are child care providers in other states, such as, I don't know, military spouses. We've got a lot of folks here um, in San Diego County. I'd like to see us be able to open uh, more child care facilities. The other is thinking through when the county um, is permitting new projects for housing or uh, other things that we're setting aside some of uh, the funding and resources for child care facilities and helping to subsidize that so that we have more facilities. And finally, uh, just sometimes direct cash is a way that helps families out. Um, and I think when we think about some of our families that are struggling to meet and uh, meet having an emergency funding supply where people can access funds to be able to afford child care is really important. All right, can I make a quick? Um, a recent study done in San Diego County says 190,000 children under the age of 12 lack child care. Um, child care right now annually costs anywhere from 12,000 all the way up to $20,000 a year. Um, so the count, I think that the county is willing to subsidize it. Um, right now, San Diego Police Department is building a facility that is going to provide child care for their officers. Um, I think the county can also build a facility um, with licensed child care providers, especially for critical workers, um, jobs that we need to create here in the county, as well as jobs that we need to keep here in the county. Um, the military has some fabulous child care um, resources on base. Uh, Camp Pendleton for the second suit. We could take some of the ideas that they have and transfer them to the civilian community. The child care is so important. Um, child care is a, a direct investment in youth success, um, early academic success, and future economic growth for the entire community. And so, if we're losing our kids to a lack of child care, then we're actually just setting ourselves and them up for failure in the future when they inherit the earth. All right, Senator Montgomery Staff. 
<laughs> oh, no. I think the most senators. I don't know what. I am so sorry. Okay. Candidate okay. Montgomery well, Stick. All right. <laughs> I've moved on. Uh, so many different different ways to approach this. The, the need is great, as, as we have heard. At the, at the city, we, we did have a prohibition against child care centers in our public facilities, so we put a, a measure on the ballot the last election, and uh, that prohibition is, is no longer there. So now we're doing an assessment of how we can use our public facilities for child care centers, and it would be really great to do something like that at the county as well. But the other aspect to this is many business owners uh, of, of child care centers are women of color. And so as we are uplifting this space, we can't. We have to remember uh, that those women and, and, and some men, but mostly women of color, uh, using their homes or having smaller facilities, we don't want to leave them out of this conversation as we get, begin to invest more in child care. Um, and lastly, I've been endorsed by United Domestic Workers who also have many, many child care providers, and it's important that they uh, have the wages that they need to be able to live and stay in San Diego as well. All right, thank you. Next question. What do you think the biggest lessons learned in the pandemic? What would you do differently? <clears throat> and we will start with candidate Montgomery Stepp. So first of all, I, I think it is very important because the hindsight is 2020, right? So, but, but in the middle of when we were learning about the pandemic and its possible effects, there were a lot of things that we did not know. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Wilma Wooten for oh, her yes. swift action. Um, we will never really know how many lives she saved by, by what she did and the way that she did it. And she was also vilified um, in, in Board of Supervisors meetings and called very racist things and everything like that. But she stood her ground, and so I do want to thank her for that. Uh, I think, though, just as any government should do, as any elected body should do, we always have to go back and monitor and evaluate the things that we could have done better because, you know, hopefully it'll be more than 100 years from now, but it may happen again, right? And some of the things that I have heard was a lack of coordination and communication. Um, that is a theme, not just with the pandemic and, and, and public health, but with a lot of the things that government deals with. Um, I've, I've heard that, you know, there were uh, things coming down the pipe that people did not know about um, and did not know how to execute. But that's what I would say. We just need to monitor and evaluate and do better the next time. Yeah, um, absolutely. Hindsight's 2020. Um, similarly, I think we we certainly were learning as we were going, and that, that may be the case again. And so, ensuring that we have clear and consistent, as consistent as we can, uh, communication with communities is is very important. I I do um, firmly believe in science and trusting the, the advice uh, and recommendations of our uh, science and medical professionals. Very proud to be endorsed by over 4,600 uh, doctors and medical professionals here in San Diego County via the San Diego County Medical Society. Um, and I think one of the things that I know I personally experienced was sort of a frustration with some of the inconsistencies uh, when things like strip clubs were open but uh, other, other businesses were not. Uh, hard to understand that as a, as, a, as a member of the public and so I think listening more um, and taking into account uh, those things. Also, we know that there was a huge discrepancy in when vaccines were available for certain communities. We had a, a lack of vaccines available for, uh, for, for communities that are in poverty um, and are uh, communities of color, and that absolutely needs to change. We need to flip the script on when those things are available. All right. <clears throat> um, so I, there was so much suspense, um, and we were so polarized. Um, during that time period, uh, now that things are somewhat calmed down, um, we I'd like to see a bipartisan, bipartisan effort to look at the actions taken and find out what the best actions were and what the worst ones were to set those aside. Um, and so, at, in the future, if we should happen to have that and another pandemic, God forbid, um, we become more proactive than reactive. Um, we were very reactive at a lot of levels, and that's just because the information, um, as Vanessa said, was not always the best or it came too late. Um, but uh, build a cohesive plan now while things are calm so that moving forward, if we should come up, come across a problem, an issue like that again, we can um, unemotionally look at things and take action rather than waiting for actions to happen to us. 
All right, next question. What does equity and racial justice look like for the 4th District? And we will start with candidate McQuick. Equity um, is like the American dream, um, home ownership, freedom to live your life um, as you want to. Um, we, district 4 is a very racially diverse district, um, and I would like to see all races live in harmony. Um, that's the goal. Um, whether you're red or blue, we're all purple, we're all part of the same communities here. And, um, uh, you know, Martin Luther King said he had a dream, right? Where everyone could live together and we don't have to worry about what the color of your skin is or where you live or where you work or what your parents do. Um, moving forward, um, that's, those are the things that I live by. Um, that's how I raised my son. And um, that's how I think the community should be. All right. Um, and candidate Montgomery Staff. So we have to be clear on what equity is. And equity is an acknowledgement that things have not been equal. And so when we're talking equity, some communities that have benefited on the backs of other communities have to sacrifice in order to make this a level playing field, which it is not. So there's a difference between equity and equality. And I'll just be, I'll just be frank here. Uh, Martin Luther King also said cut the check because he acknowledged that there was such disparity and inequity in our nation that just making an integrated nation did not solve the problems of creating communities that had been disinvested in on purpose, creating economic conditions that resulted in crime and poverty. And so when we talk about racial justice and equity, that is what we are talking about. And that has been my life's work. And we have to talk about it in a real way, not a vanilla way. All right, um, and then Kennedy go back. Uh, I could not agree with uh, the council member more, more strongly when it comes to the county, this district is, is incredibly diverse. Uh, we have communities uh, all across the district of different racial backgrounds, um, but at the at fundamentally, when it comes to budgeting, um, we have to take an equity-based approach and ensure that we are investing in communities that have been historically disinvested in um, by pri prioritizing those communities and asking ourselves who's not at the table. It's really important to understand that some of the biggest service providers, people who are helping lift, lift people out of poverty and educate our kids and ensure that people who are involved in the justice system do not wind up back in the justice system, not all of those organizations have big development departments and lobbyists that can go to the county and, and have their voices heard. And so I think it's very important that we think about who's doing the work in our communities, that we're making sure that grassroots organizations that might not necessarily have all the resources that big organizations have um, are, are getting the attention and resources they need to do the work as well. All right, next question. The county is devoting record resources to mental health. What do you see specifically as the greatest needs in that area? And we'll start with candidate Gopin. Well, we spoke a little bit earlier about our lack of psychiatric facilities and our lack of uh, behavioral health workers. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how we divert uh, from incarceration um, and, and ensure that people who are experiencing acute psychiatric episodes get the care they need and reduce their interactions with law enforcement. And the county has a program, Mobile Crisis Response Teams. These are trained uh, psychiatric uh, in, uh, professionals and medical professionals and social workers uh, who go out and uh, interact with folks and, and try to connect them to services if they're experiencing this. We need to expand those crisis response teams um, and make sure that they have all the resources they need to have faster response times in every part of the county because that's, that's not really the case right now. Uh, the other thing is ensuring that we have long-term care facilities for people who need it. And there's a lot of money coming down from the state, uh, over $500 million to invest in boarding care facilities and facilities where people can get the medications and, and help that they need. Uh, but we have to aggressively go after that if we're going to open more of those types of places here in San Diego County. All right. 
I've always said that um, the county needs to um, build a 500-bed facility. Um, but we also need people to staff that as well. Um, and um, so a little bit of history about the VA. So the Veterans Administration, they had a mental health crisis on their hands um, with all these veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. So what they did was they started building vet centers, veteran centers, all throughout the county, all throughout the country. And these are small cells of licensed providers in the community. What we have here in District 4 and a lot of it in Sancho, Webster, there are medical deserts. Right? We don't have those small, little mental health facilities like we could have, where you have maybe three or four providers there where someone can walk in with a mental health crisis and get someone to talk to them, or they can connect them with the resource that they need. If we could have those little satellites around the county that uh, the people can easily um, access them rather than having to travel to a major hospital and then wait in a waiting room for hours, we're going to limit the amount of um, damage that's done to a person's psyche as they go on through it. Yeah, I definitely agree that we uh, need more facilities um, and we need more beds. Uh, we are turning people away that actually want help right now. And so uh, before we begin to focus on those who may not uh, be in the position to accept help, we have to focus on the people that we are turning away right now that want help. But also, it's important to note that in this industry, uh, workers are experiencing burnout, major, major burnout. And over the next five years, we will need over 18,000 workers in the behavioral health uh, services industry. And what we are hearing from a lot of members our, of our community that work in the industry is that they want to stay and they want to live here, but they are not being paid enough to live here. Um, and it results in them either, either leaving California altogether or leaving the industry. So we have to continue to focus on uh, those types of investments, maybe some uh, student loan forgiveness and other things to, to incentivize people being a part of the industry. All right, next question. We all know homelessness is a serious problem in San Diego County and it has and it has dealing with homelessness has become a larger portion of and oh, I'm sorry. Let me let me rephrase the question again. I'm sorry. Uh, we all know homelessness is a serious problem in San Diego County and it has become a larger portion of the county budget. What would you do differently at the county? How would you improve regional coordination? And we will start with um, candidate Montgomery Stout. Yeah, so we spoke about this a, a bit earlier, but it's good to hone in on what the issues are. We have a philanthropic community. We have all of our, our government folks. <laughs> Everyone wants to solve the issue, right? So I don't think that there's a lack of motivation there. This really coordination, is it, it, it's the really hard work that no one sees in government. That is what we need. We're, when we talk about this data system, the reason why I keep going back to it is because it's, we, you're paying taxpayer dollars to hold up this data system that is not working. People are still falling through the cracks, even though it's supposed to be sort of the center of all of our services. And so I think that that's very, very important. Initiatives are extremely important. We need rental subsidies. I uh, even want to pilot some guaranteed basic income. We need all of the things. We need additional housing. We need additional beds. But we can have all these things and still not have a coordinated effort. So people are falling through the cracks. And the last thing quickly I'll say is I want to hone in on widening the procurement process for additional nonprofit organizations that are not a part of this conversation but doing work on, on the grassroots level. So all of these things are extremely important with regard to coordination. All right, and um, candidate Goldbeck? I think, you know, people are extremely frustrated uh, in San Diego County that we keep hearing the same things from elected officials that they're going to solve the problem and things just get, keep getting worse. Our numbers are, are rising. And absolutely, coordination is part of it. Um, but also, thinking a little bit bigger about what the county's role in solving this problem should be. You know, for many years, the county sat on its hands and said, homelessness is not our problem. That's the city of San Diego. Those other cities around the region. That's not what we do. They sat on a $2.4 billion reserve fund. 
And today, even with the Democratic majority, the fund uh, of our, the, our reserve fund is still $2.4 billion, uh, which is three times what the state says is a fiscally responsible amount for us to have on hand. So absolutely, we need to uh, tighten up our coordination, make sure that all grassroots providers are, are part of the conversation, but we also need to just invest in in larger shelters, uh, emergency shelter opportunities at scale. Make sure that we, the county is playing a leading role in opening safe parking lots and opening camping sites and bringing manufactured homes onto county land so we can connect people with services, but get them off the street. And I think there's a, there's a serious uh, lack of, um, or a serious desire from the, from the public to, to see that happen. All right. Um, I I spent a lot of time talking to my neighbors, people in other communities. Um, people are afraid to leave their homes at the village because they're afraid of being accosted by a homeless person or a drug addict. Um, the county, just like Vanessa said, needs to take a leadership role in this. It's a county issue, it's not just a San Diego issue, it's not just an Oceanside issue. I've already outlaid part of my plan that we need to bring everyone to one place and provide them with what they need. People are expecting the homeless to, to meet the homeless where they want them to be. That's not reality. We need to meet them where they are and then help to build them up to the point where we want them to be. I have not seen a cohesive plan on paper from anyone. I've just seen words, talk, and money thrown at a problem. We need to put a plan on paper with milestones and goals and set those forward and then move forward with the plan and act and um, operate it with intention, with compassion, and with a goal of, now you're not going to go 100%, um, everyone off the streets, but you can make a huge um, difference if you have a cohesive plan and that's what we need from the county level. All right, and then a, a related question. What do you see as the county's role in approving developments? Obviously this is in the unincorporated area, and specifically increasing affordable housing. And we will start with um, candidate McQuig. So we've heard that there's a housing emergency, but it still takes like nine months or maybe a year and a half to get permits done. So if there's a housing emergency, why aren't we issuing permits on an emergency basis? So you can't tell them that one thing's going on and then tell them no on the other hand. So that's one thing we need to speed up the process of permitting. Um, we also need to look at alternative ways uh, for housing. Um, a lot of our seniors are losing their housing. Um, they've never been homeless before. They're on a fixed income. Um, my mom is one of those. My father is also one of those. He lives in San Marcos. Uh, my mom is in Oceanside. She's actually here tonight. Um, and we can invest in um, pre-made housing, uh, prefabricated housing, that can be shipped from a factory to this location within seven days and set up and we can get these homeless seniors back into houses where they can live on that fixed income that they've retired on and they've worked their whole lives to enjoy their retirement here in San Diego. Uh, that's it. All right, thank you. And then we have Kennedy um, one of the, so I absolutely agree with speeding up the permitting process that, that um, our development services department uh, would, would love, I think, for there to be a greater investment um, in, in their staff and making sure that they have everything they need so we can get things done quicker. Um, what we've also done in San Diego County is rule out large swaths of land in the unincorporated areas uh, and said we, we can't build here because it's not close to public transit and we, don't, we want to reduce emissions on the road. I think that's a backwards way of looking at things when we're in a housing crisis. The county has the ability to put public transit out to other parts of the county. We can send clean energy vehicles out into East County. We can send clean energy buses into Spring Valley and into Rancho San Diego. Um, why would we take land off the map that we could build, develop, uh, build affordable housing on um, simply because we haven't invested in the infrastructure to provide transit? So, I think the county needs to uh, widen the aperture on where we can build uh, affordable and middle income housing while staying committed to our climate goals, um, but, but turning the question around and saying, how do we get to yes on this instead of no? All right, um, we're gonna switch gears here a bit. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. I'll be quick. Senator Michael. <laughs> 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 
I, no, I, I, I'll be quick because I do think that, that, that permitting is a, is a huge issue here. It often uh, discourages uh, developers um, from the time frame that it, that it does take. I think community input is also extremely important, um, in the, especially in the unincorporated areas. So people do have community planning groups in the unincorporated areas, and they also want to be able uh, to give input when it comes to housing and development. So I think all of those things are extremely important. This is, um, uh, this issue is a balancing act because we do have to meet our climate action goals. They are state mandated. Uh, we have areas in unincorporated um, regions that um, insurance companies are no longer providing insurance, homeowners insurance for building out in these areas because of the risk that that is uh, the calculated risk there and so yes we have to be smarter about how we build of course um, and we have to be dedicated to that permitting is really a, a big key to that and being smart in the way that we build so the insurance companies don't want to pay them money. all right That's why. next question um do you agree the with the change Sorry, let me repeat the question again. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> um, we're, we're having right. our own little sorry, sidebar. Sorry. <laughs> um, do you agree with the change the Board of Supervisors has made um, in their discretionary funds? And um, we will begin with um, Kendi. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, 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 listen. I don't agree. I I I understand. I understand there are reasons for efficiency, um, why they are no longer bringing uh, the grantees, you know, to the to the board. But I I don't agree with it. We do this on a much smaller scale at the city. We're not giving away millions, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe. But every single uh, nonprofit organization that we give to is on the agenda. And if the public wants to come to the meeting, they have an opportunity to speak on that item, item whether they agree or not. So I think there's just no reason to hide. Um, uh, and even if the intention wasn't to hide, you allow for a narrative to be created by not just being transparent and upfront. So I do not agree with that most recent action. Um, and I do think that the grantees need to be placed on an agenda for the public to see and comment. All right, thank you. And candidate McQuig? I would have voted Mill on that initiative, 100%. Um, no. Um, no government in the United States operates without the taxes that we pay. Um, that's our money um, that goes into that, those coffers. Um, so we have the right to know where that money's going. Um, and um, so, it's all be out in the open. If my money's been spent, or if their money's been spent, we want to know where their money's going, what the return on the investment is, because that's what taxes are, the investment on the future of the country or whatever they're paying those taxes to. Um, I feel that right now with a 2-2 split at the county level, I think that we are seeing a lot of majority 4-0 votes and things, and they're just kind of going about business as usual. Uh, not working as much in ways and just moving forward and trying to get through this process until someone else is elected. Um, and I don't see a lot of discussion at that level um, or um, dissension. Um, they're just going along with it. And uh, whoever proposes it, then that's the way it's going to be. We all agree on this topic. Uh, I think given the nature of this election, it's why this seat's open in the first place, it's more important than ever to create uh, more transparency and, uh, and, and ensure that people have a way to restore trust in their local government, <clears throat> the county in, in particular. And so in addition to uh, bringing those grants back to uh, public votes so the public can come and comment on them, I think we need to do a couple of additional things to restore trust and confidence. One, the county doesn't have an independent ethics commission. Why is that? We should have one of those. Uh, to investigate public employees, and uh, that includes elected officials, to make sure that they're acting ethically in their duties. Two, we have an opportunity coming up to uh, app appoint the next chief administrative officer. This is a person who will have generational impact on the county. Right now, the public is not involved in that conversation at all. When San Diego Unified selected their next superintendent, they had over 30 opportunities for the public to weigh in on that process. 
The CIO position is completely behind closed doors. And that might have been fine in the past, but given where we are today, I think we need to open it up to the public. All right, and this will be our final question. Um, and I hope I get this right. Um, all our questions and responses um, made speak to the great diversity of approaches and solutions. Can you please share um, kind of your expertise on building consensus and how, as a supervisor, you would work with um, the other board members? All right, and we will start with um, candidate Goldman. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I served in the Marine Corps for seven years. I joined when I was 26. I was part of the first wave of openly gay officers. Um, <coughs> I'm a proud Democrat, a woman in an institution that's uh, relatively conservative and over 90% uh, male. Um, and the thing about the military, the U.S. military, and Paul can attest to this as well, is one of the last places in American society where people from all walks of life come together to achieve a common cause. And um, I really fell in love with that. And it taught me a lot about how to communicate with people who have very different belief systems and values and opinions of my own. At the end of the day, you have to accomplish the mission. And I'm really proud to say that in my professional life, uh, running a National Veterans Advocacy Organization, working to get bills passed, at the federal level, including expanding veterans' health care benefits to over 5 million veterans across the country. We have to work across the aisle to do things, to get things done. Um, I believe that we're never gonna, you're never going to uh, agree with everybody 100% of the time. My wife and I don't agree with each other half the time. Um, so to think that you're going to agree with your elected colleagues all the time um, is, is obviously a little pie in the sky. But you can find places where you agree and move the ball, and that should be the goal of public service. All right, candidate Montgomery Staff. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I am the only candidate that has actual experience in bringing together uh, other elected officials that are representative of, you know, 160,000 people in that one vote. So it's one thing to kind of be in a group uh, and agree as a coalition. It's another thing to bring consensus to a group and a body that is representative of the entire city of San Diego. And I've done that on some very controversial issues around police reform. When I was first elected to city council, it was a 5-4 vote. So not everybody was a Democrat. And all of uh, everything that I have championed has come out with a unanimous vote because I understand how to listen to people, how to incorporate their input, no matter you know what their affiliations are or what their beliefs are. Um, we had a common cause that we were doing this for the entire city of San Diego, an issue that had never been brought before the city council in the way that I brought them. Uh, I was able to get unanimous support for those. And so that's the spirit I will bring uh, to the Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> so I've always said that I, I threw this uh, county as a purple county, um, but I, I am the only candidate that has worldwide global experience of getting um, Sunni Muslims and Syriac Muslims to organizations that want to kill each other for thousands of years to work together for the common goal. Um, I sat down with Russian generals and Georgian generals. If you know your world history, Georgia and Russia have been at war a couple of times in this uh, century already. Um, and help, help them work to a common goal. I've worked with coalitions of 40 plus nations in order to achieve a common goal. I've gone to war zones and built those cities. Uh, I've gone to places where there have been earthquakes and helped provide humanitarian relief, um, building tents, providing people with services. The problems that affect San Diego are global problems, they're global issues. And there's no one else that's running in this election that has tackled those issues or worked with people who have <laughs> wanted to kill each other so bad to get them to achieve a common goal. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I want to thank the candidates um, for responding to the questions. And um, before they give their closing remarks, I want to thank all of you for coming and asking questions. Um, remember some key dates. Um, the ballots will be mailed to San Diego County District 4 residents um, around July 17th. Um, election day is August 15th. You can mail your ballot back, return it to one of the drop-off locations, or participate in the 10 days of early in-person voting. So go to sdvote.com, that's sdvote.com. Um, to find more information in your nearest voting location. And so now for their closing statements. Again, each candidate is going to have two minutes, and we're going to reverse the order. And so this time we will begin with um, candidate McQuig. Uh, so 
People of District 4 have had uh, some disappointment. Um, they elected a supervisor last year, um, and then over this year, that supervisor announced that he was going to run for a higher office, so he's going to leave the people of District 4 behind. Um, shortly after that, he resigned under, uh, because of his own misconduct. Um, you also have the people of District 4 in the city. And last year, they elected a new uh, a city councilwoman who made them promises and said she was going to do things for them. And then shortly after that, when this suit opened up, she said that she was going to move on and leave those people behind without the, finishing the job that she had started. Um, I'm going to finish the job. I've planted roots here in District 4. My son is coming back here. I bought a home here. I don't have any desire to move on. I want to stay here in District 4 work on the issues, bring viable solutions, and uh, work towards a better district for everyone. I don't have any ambitions of going to become the governor like Nathan Fletcher did. Um, I just want to be here in district four, live in peace with my neighbors, and have a place for my son to come, and my mother to live in peace in Oceanside, and my father to live in peace in San Marcos. And um, that's why I'm running. And I'm not going to leave the people of District 4 behind. I will stay until the job is finished or someone better comes along. Uh, I just want to say thank you again to everyone for being here. And thank you to the League of Women Voters of San Diego for being so diligent in your quest to have informed voters in our region. Um, uh, I'm very, very honored to be here with you all this evening, and I have to just say that I did not include in my endorsement list my mother, who is here, uh, <laughs> and also my husband, who is here. Uh, so I want to thank my family uh, for, for coming out uh, to, to join us this evening. When I was 20 years old at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune illness. Um, it impacted and affected my skin and muscles. I was going to school full time. I was waiting tables. And my life abruptly stopped at 20 years old. Uh, my brother had to bring me home from, uh, from Atlanta to San Diego. He had to get a wheelchair for me when we drove up to the airport. He had to help me out of that chair onto the plane. Um, and back home to my family who had to then take care of me and quit what they had going on in their jobs and apply for county services to, in order for us to even be able to live. And so to be here before you now is nothing less than a miracle. And to be, have the opportunity to sit in that seat and make decisions from that personal perspective, but also my professional experience. While I was sick, I went to law school. While I was sick. I, no matter what, have fought for the most vulnerable people in our community. Whether that was being at the ACLU and fighting to change this horrid system, the Bell system. Whether that was being a city council member and fighting for my community to receive over $100 million in investments in five years, which has not been done in a very long time, and to do everything that I said I would do for the community that I grew up in and that I was raised in, I did it. And so no matter what, I will continue to fight for the most vulnerable parts of our community, and I will be glad to serve as your first black woman Board of Supervisors in San Diego's history and to serve you honorably. Thank you. All right. And then I mean, candidate Colbert. <laughs> I want to apologize right up front to the candidate. I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, I noticed you didn't call me a senator. You can have it. You can have it. You can have it. Um, well, just thank you again for, for um, everyone for being here this evening. Um, I think, you know, regardless of your political background or who you are, who you're supporting up here, um, you're obviously uh, folks who care deeply about our community. Um, I think everyone sitting up here, uh, and anyone who jumps in the arena to run cares deeply about uh, making their community better. So I just want to say thanks, and it's a, a privilege to be with you all. Um, you know, I 
when I was uh, serving in the Marine Corps, going about my life, um, pursuing what I felt was my career, moving on, going to grad school, I never thought that in my late 20s I would need to come, stop everything, come home to take care of my mom. And uh, it was a really illuminating experience for me to understand just how difficult navigating the system is when you're caring for uh, a sick parent or somebody in your life who can't care for themselves. And having all the resources I had at my disposal, a good job, my mom's union pension, which paid for part of her care and paid for her health care benefits, uh, having a master's degree, all these things, still it was so overwhelming and challenging to try to find a place that worked for her that we could afford. And when I uh, think about people in San Diego County who don't even have a tenth of what I had, um, a family to support me and all, all of those other things, um, I see the crisis that we've been talking about tonight, our homelessness crisis, that to me is personal. That, 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 those people who are sleeping on the streets tonight, those, that could have been my mother if I wasn't here. And so I got into this race in February before Nathan Fletcher announced, he was, was, uh, announced uh, everything that was happening, um, thinking this would be a couple of years out, that I'd be running for a seat that'd be open in a few years. And I wanted to start early because I wanted to have conversations with our community like this one. Um, where I wasn't just showing up and asking you for something. Well, life had different plans. The election's now in just a couple, starts in a couple of days. Um, and I would be very honored to earn your support. I hope that this is the beginning of a longer conversation if we've just met tonight. Uh, please check out my website if you'd like to learn more, janessagoldbeck.com. But I'd be honored to earn your support and thank you for being here again with us tonight. All right, so on behalf of Second Chance, and the League of Women Voters of San Diego, I wanna thank the candidates for running for office. Um, it's not an easy task. And for, and for attending our forum this evening. Might we give them a round of applause? <laughs> and again, I wanna thank you. And thank you again. And uh, you have to have been here tonight because um, you are following the League's motto. The League's motto which is don't just be a voter, be an informed voter. So thank you very much.